Sober Sober Life and um, today I am going to be interviewing Lisa of Raw Food Romance um, and she is the co-founder of the Ultimate Raw Vegan Bundle so you can ask her, she's 100% raw so you can ask her like everything about going raw we're also going to be talking about her ebook Party Food check it out, it's raw vegan party food, how cool is that? and it's actually um, Everything here is uh, oil-free, raw vegan. Yeah, hello, raw koala. Hello. Oh, hi, Lisa. Okay, let me just pin the comment first and then we can get started. Um, pin comment. Okay, cool. Uh, okay, how do I invite Lisa to... Maybe, Lisa, you need to... Um, ah, request. Okay, cool. Go live. Da, 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 da. Hello. Are those running medals? Hi. Hello. Oh, good. I can hear you. <laughs> Great. Good. Excellent. I can hear you too. That's awesome. Nice. So, how are you? I'm great. I'm great. I'm so busy with all of the bundle stuff. Oh my goodness, but it's worth it. It's so worth okay. it. All right, great. Thanks so much for accommodating me at this time. I know it's it's late and I I was just listening to your um live with Karen and you mentioned that you go to sleep at 9. So <laughs> thanks for we like up to, to do this. We like to go to sleep at nine, but it hasn't been happening lately, so <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> okay, so welcome everyone. Um, so this is uh, this is part of the raw vegan ultimate raw vegan bundle experience, and um, there has been like tons of lives going on, and today I will be interviewing Lisa of Raw Food Romance. <laughs> and uh, we'll be speaking about loads of things. I think um, I was saying that uh, a lot of people in Malaysia, at least, are not, you know, they're not very familiar with what raw food is. And I, uh, I, I don't know whether I've met anybody who's actually 100% raw. <laughs> so I thought I would love to hear a bit about that. And then also, your book. Oh my god, party food. I, I was just going through it this morning. I'm like, I want to make this. I want to make the neat balls. I want to make the kale chips. I want to make... I actually bought um, the ingredients to make your um, mini pizzas. <laughs> but then after that, we had a water cut for four days. So I mm. couldn't make it. But I managed yeah. to make your quiche in the other book. And then we also talked a bit about your food photography as well. So that'd be really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, maybe you can just start off introducing yourself for those who, you know, don't know who you are and all that, and then we'll take it from there. Cool. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me on your live. It's awesome to connect with you like this, because I've been following your page for a long time, because your food photography is, like, <laughs> mind-blowingly awesome. I seriously, I, I, I admire your plating. Like, oh, thank like you. the fanciness of your food. And I, I look at the stuff and I'm like, I got to up my game because <laughs> you are so talented. So thank you. It's an honor to be here. Um, my name is Lissa from Raw Food Romance. For those that don't know, I have been a raw vegan for just over seven years now. I went raw in 2014 and I tried to do a raw diet from 2004 to 2014. I was always doing like high fat. I was restricting my calories. I just wasn't eating a lot of variety and I wasn't eating a lot of fruit either because I had um, like a sugar fear. I thought fruit was, you know, you could only have like half a banana or whatever. So, you know, <laughs> so I was for 10 years, I tried over and over and over like hundreds of times to try a raw diet. And I did other diets, I did other like cleanses and that kind of stuff. And it never stuck until 2014. And I think the reason why it did in 2014 was twofold for one or threefold, I guess. In 2014 is when I went vegan. So I had never had the vegan connection before that. I only wanted to be a raw foodie. I just wanted to mm. eat raw food, whether that was animal products back then or just vegan, but I never had the vegan connection, like why vegan, right? 
So in 2014, I woke up in the middle of the night with like heart flutters. They were, I felt like I was having a heart attack. And that happened like three times a week. I would wake up in the middle of the night and I would think I was dying. Oh my God, that's so scary. It was really scary, yeah. And, and then I wouldn't be able to get back to sleep because I'd be thinking about it. Like, what if I actually died? Yeah. And I dreaded sleep. It was like the worst time. I didn't want to go to sleep. And then I would kind of like make work for myself. But I, I did have like an overabundance of work because I was doing photography full time and I'd be up till two in the morning sometimes working on my photography business. And I would like work extra late so I, I didn't have to go to bed or I'd be so tired that I'd fall asleep at my desk just so I didn't have to sleep in bed because I knew I was going to wake up with these heart palpitations or flutters. And I think that had a lot to do with all the energy drinks and coffees that I was drinking at that time. I was oh, eating okay. the worst diet. I was eating junk food, like chips for breakfast and just like hardly any vegetables at all. <laughs> And I was just really unhealthy. So in 2014, I woke up with these heart flutters and I decided, I was like, that's it. I really need to change. I need to do something different. So I went to my computer and I, I looked through all my journals and stuff and I was like, I need to go raw again, but I need to figure out why it wasn't working for me and why I constantly was failing at doing this lifestyle. And I watched, I binge watched some videos on YouTube and discovered the low fat version of raw. And I watched the documentaries. So Cowspiracy uh. was brand new at the time and uh, Forks Over Knives and Earthlings. So I watched those and immediately I was vegan. I was like, okay, <laughs> like now I need, to, now I'm like committed legitimately to choosing vegan foods and I chose raw because that's what I knew. I always thought vegans ate raw or high raw. I didn't oh. realize, I didn't realize that there was like this whole like cooked vegan thing. I was like, I thought they were just all raw foodies, right? So I went, I went raw because it resonated the most. It made the most sense. And because this time was different than the other decade before that, I was actually eating enough calories every day and I was doing low fat. So it was super easy. I found it really sustainable because I was nourishing my body. I wasn't restricting myself. I wasn't eating super high amounts of fats. So that really is how I found raw. And I've been raw for, like I mentioned now over seven years. So it's been wonderful. And I don't, see myself going back and it, yeah it's been it's been such a great time yeah and you've been sharing so much i i know i've learned so much from your youtube videos from your reels from just your posts i'm like wow every post has so much information and so oh, many tips thank and you it's so good mm -hmm. yeah thank you yeah yeah so what you about you know because um for me i'm i'm not 100 percent raw although i would like to be um, I have, my breakfast is raw and my dinner is raw. Mm -hmm. And then I, um, two to three times a week, I eat some cooked food um, because I either eat out or, yeah, or, well, now we order in, we don't eat out. Um, <laughs> or, um, you know, because my boyfriend likes to eat rice. So I'm mm -hmm. like, oh, since I'm cooking rice for him, I might as well just eat the rice as well. If not, I have to like make even more raw food for me. So, mm -hmm. um, but I remember when I was traveling a lot, I, I, um, I tended I tend to eat cooked food because it was, it's harder to find um, raw food out there. Mm -hmm. uh, or it's just salads. And I'm like, I'm a foodie. So I'm always like, I don't want to go out and eat a salad when I'm traveling. I want to try, you know, the local food. So how, how did you deal with that? Ah, with traveling. Yeah, Nate yeah. and I, we do so much like fun stuff. And I feel like to us, it's a game. It's like, it's, we find it fun to find ways to eat raw when we're traveling. Like it, it's just a blast. So what we do is we plan out what we're going to eat for the trip. So if it's a road trip, we'll plan out what we need to take on the road trip. And we plan out what we're going to do when we get to our Airbnb or our camping spot or whatever. And when we're traveling to like other cities 
or even when we go to other countries, we make sure that there's stuff for us. So when we went to Mexico, for example, um, we, we stayed at a resort and it's, it wasn't a raw vegan resort or anything. It wasn't even a vegan resort. It's just regular resort. We were there for one of my friend's weddings and we managed to eat raw the entire time because we just took the raw stuff that they had at the buffet and we made these like beautiful salads and we had a lot of, we had a lot of guacamole and salsa <laughs> as our dressings because we didn't have our Vitamix. So we couldn't make our own dressings, but it was great because we were only there for 10 days. So it wasn't a big deal, but we got to experience the flavors from Mexico without having to eat all of the other resort foods. And when we go, say we go on a long road trip or we're going to go to different cities, we always check to see like, where are the grocery stores? Where do we need to stop? What are we going to do? We take our Vitamix with us when we go traveling, if we can. Um, mm -hmm. When I went to Montreal to get my visa to move to the United States to marry Nate, I took my Vitamix with me because I was there for about a week and I just packed it in my check bag. It was worth the $30 to pay for my checked bag. <laughs> it was like, I've got my blender with me and I plugged it in in the hotel room and I went to the grocery store. I bought my fruit and I made dressings there. I just bought a little spice you know, like a little spice shaker with some paprika and I had bulbs of garlic and I would buy containers of dates so that I had that for my dressing. I ate really simply, but I was able to do it in the hotel room. And I had such an amazing experience doing it that way. And yes, there was like, I got to walk down like the streets in Montreal and, and there's that vibe, right? Where you wanna sit down with everyone else and, and eat the food and everything. But I found comfort in just walking up and down the streets and smelling what was in the air and seeing all the people sitting and eating. That was enough for me because I felt I eat the way I eat because I know that that's how I feel my best. And I can still enjoy the ambiance. I can enjoy the being served at a restaurant if it's raw, if they do provide raw stuff. I can still enjoy those aspects of it without having to eat those foods. But again, it's not like it's 100% is the only way to go, right? Like that's something that can be a disordered thought process, right? And mm. some people, they feel like it's the only way and then they sit in that box and it's okay for some people, but for other people, it just, it creates this disordered mindset. Mm -hmm. So I broke free from that box about three or four years ago when I realized that I can eat anything I want, but what yeah. is it that I truly want? What do I really want to be putting into my body? And I could eat pizza. I could eat potato chips, but do I really want that? Like is, do I want the entire experience of that? Because it really only tastes good up here and not down here. So yeah, yeah. So I really think about that. But Nate and I plan stuff, and if we do end up, you know, in the future going to other countries, we want to experience the produce, like the fresh fruits uh -huh. that grow locally in wherever we go. Like if we went to, for example, we talk about going to Italy, and if we go to Italy right? It's going to be the tomatoes, it's going to be the olives, and a lot of the foods that grow really well in that climate, we're going to really enjoy a lot of those foods because they don't taste the same as they do here. So we can still enjoy part of the culture by eating the raw foods that they have. And we could make like cucumber noodles, make a a marinara pasta sauce with the fresh tomatoes and we could even sun dry some Italian tomatoes would be so delicious. Right. And, and then make our own pastas so we can still feel part of it, but choosing things that we feel are best eating. So that's what we do. Kind of, we, we just make sure we plan. We make sure that there's a grocery store around. We call ahead to restaurants because a lot of places are really happy to make us raw stuff. Like even here in Vegas, there's a place called True Food Kitchen, and they said, if you want anything raw, we'll make it for you. You just have to call us like a day or two in advance so we can find a recipe and we can make it for you, like get everything prepped for your arrival. 
and we'll have raw food for you. And we're like, really? That is so awesome. But all you got to do is ask because people are more likely to want to do it if you ask and you tell them what you're looking for because you're paying for it anyways. And the chefs mm -hmm. are excited to make something different because they're making yes. the same stuff every day, right? Like, yes. How Keep many, up the challenge. Yeah, how many times do I have to make this dish, right? So when, they're, when they have an opportunity to get creative, that's the whole reason why they're chefs. That's why you're a chef. That's why I'm a chef. We love to get creative. And when you're stuck in a, in a rut nine to five chef job, you're making the same stuff over and over and over and over again. So you kind of lose that creative touch. So it, you're more than welcome to ask your, the restaurant if they're willing to make something unique just for you. And many places are really happy to do that. So we, we do that too. And, and we're greeted with excitement and creativity. Oh, that's such a great tip. Yeah, I remember yeah, when I used to travel, I used to bring my, my travel blender along with me as well so that I could get my green smoothies in. At least I have something raw in the morning. Mm -hmm. And then um, I would go to the nearby markets and, you know, just buy like fresh cilantro and fresh Thai basil or something. And then when I eat the cooked food, then I add in all my other raw stuff. <laughs> so right. I get a bit of raw. Yeah, because yeah, it's about eating more raw up to all raw like it, it really depends on where people want to go with it and it's mostly i would say it's mostly about eating low fat and being vegan those are like the top two and then just keep adding more raw because i feel like a lot of people again they get those blinders on they're like i have to stay 100 percent, and if they can't stay 100 percent, then sometimes it feels too much and then they just go back to eating a lot of the other foods that they're used to because it's too hard to stay 100%. So instead of trying to be 100%, just focus on adding more and more and more and more until maybe that's all you want to eat, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And there's no, yeah. there's no right or wrong way, but obviously doing all raw days is going to feel great. And if you like that, then keep doing it. I think people are a little bit too, can be too strict with that at times. Yeah, I, I feel a huge difference between eating raw and cooked. So that, that's why I mm -hmm. said, like, I, I want to, you know, I would love. So, yeah, like, yes, I think, yes, was I, yesterday, were we 100%? No, yesterday we weren't. But today, I'm just going to be, yeah. Nice, 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 nice. Yeah. yeah, and some days you are, and some days you aren't. And, and if you want to do all raw days, I, I always tell people to do it because you want to. Mm, not because exactly. you're scared of cooked food or you think cooked yeah. food's going to hurt you or anything. Just do it because you love it and it yeah. tastes good. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Oh, can you talk a little bit about low fat? Because I think when I first discovered raw food um, and because I, 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 I studied at the raw, um, raw and plant-based academy at Matthew Kenny, it was, it was very high fat. It tasted really good. It's gourmet raw food, but definitely... <laughs> I fat. So if you can talk a little bit more about low fat, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for the first 10 years of my journey, I did the high fat thing too. I was into the gourmet raw. I was eating lots of avocados, lots of nuts. I wasn't eating enough greens and I wasn't eating enough fruit. So I was really focused on the raw gourmet and the high fat and it was causing insulin resistance. I was sluggish all the time. I didn't have enough energy, I had brain fog, and I just didn't feel awesome. Like, a lot of people would be like, oh, I feel amazing on a raw food diet. And I'd be like, well, why don't I? What's wrong? Or <laughs> like, why isn't it working for me? And I did feel better than I felt when I was eating the junk food and the animal products. Obviously, I was feeling better, but I was just like, I felt like something was missing. Like okay, I'm doing this, I'm trying really hard, and I'm falling off, and I'm having cravings, and I don't understand why. And it wasn't until I went low fat, where I realized that I could eat abundantly, I could eat lots of fruit, and lots of greens, and big salads, and have a lot of energy while still getting my essential fats here in a smaller amount, and feel amazing. So it took me 10 years to figure that out. And like every once in a while, Nate, Nate and I will have something that is higher fat, but we eat it 
appropriately. That's how I like to say, like, we eat it appropriately. It's not like we're restricting it or we're like only allowed a certain little amount. We just mm -hmm. eat it appropriately. Yeah. So if we're going to have like a cashew cheesecake or something like that, we enjoy a big low fat salad. And then we have a piece of the cheesecake after. And during the day we're doing almost no fat, like no fat in our smoothies, no fat for our snacks because they're fruit, a low fat lunch and a low fat dinner. And then we can have the, the pie without ha having our whole day out of whack by eating like high fat lunch and a high fat dinner and the cheesecake, right? Our fat percentage would be way too high. And then the next day we would just feel like zombies, just super like, oh, yeah. <laughs> just no energy. <laughs> so when we eat appropriate amounts of fat, we feel so much better because our bodies can use the fruit sugar and the sugar from our vegetables a lot more efficiently when fat isn't blocking insulin from opening the cell and getting the sugar in there. So again, it's not about no fat, right? A lot of people are like, no, I, don't, I can't do any fat, but that's not the point. The point is to eat a smaller amount which is appropriate for the human body. And if you think about it too, like we've never had access to bags of nuts, right? Mm -hmm. Like that yeah. hasn't been part of our evolution, so to speak, right? Yeah. We've never had, like our ancestors didn't have bags of nuts and snacking on yeah. nuts, right? They were snacking on fruit because that was the most easy, ideal thing to do. And if they were gonna have nuts, it was in the fruit. They were hydrating. They weren't dried and stored for years in bulk bins at the grocery store. They were raw from the fruit. So that's how I believe that we got our fats. Part of our fats from nuts back then was just from, from the fruit. Like if you're eating almonds, for example, like an almond, you would pick the droop, which is kind of like an apricot. You would pick that off the tree. You'd probably eat the apricot which is low fat because there's no fat in the apricot. And then you would crack the seed and you would probably eat the seed, which has the same texture as a grape. But we dry them and they become uh, like preserved basically because when you take the water out, just like with dehydration, you take the water out and it's less likely to go bad. That's why kale chips, you can have them in your cupboard for a while and it doesn't mm -hmm. rot because you've taken all the water out and the water is the life force. So nuts and seeds are essential on a raw diet, but they should be used, like they should be sprouted. They should be turned into microgreens or they could be used in a dressing with a big abundant hydrating salad to replace the water that we take out when we dry the nuts and seeds. So yeah, low fat is totally amazing. I, I was scared of doing low fat in the beginning because I was taught we needed all these healthy fats and fats were good and fats are good, but we, again, we needed to eat them appropriately. Yeah. I, I, I think I was telling Chris, I was telling Nate that I really enjoyed um, working on my ebook for this ultimate Rovingham bundle because it it was oil free, it was low fat and oil free, and um, I never placed that restriction on any of my recipes. So this time uh, I had to keep checking chronometer, but I loved it because it was oil free. I felt so much better, and I just yeah, I mm -hmm. I'm like okay, maybe I should just make all my recipes oil free. Except it it will be hard for my desserts. So mm -hmm. yeah, I know right sometimes. <laughs> But yeah, I love that we can play with different ideas, right? Like you don't have to use oils to have an amazing dish. Like we made one of your recipes for it's going to it's coming in one of my reels that I'm going to post. Yay. It was cool. so good. I can't remember which one it was <laughs> off the top of my head right now, but it was so good. We're eating it. And we're like, "Oh my goodness, this is amazing." It's so great. I think was it one of the noodles? I think it was the... I, I think it would maybe it was the curry. Wait, maybe it wasn't the curry. I can't remember off the top of my head. It was the one with the baby corn. Oh, the one with the baby... Oh, but I used baby corn twice. I think okay. it was the noodles. I think you sent me the... Yeah, I think yeah. it was, was the it noodle the one. Yeah. yeah. With miso and coconut mm -hmm. and limos or something. Yeah. Yeah, that. that was the one. And it was so good. We didn't have all the ingredients for the salad part. So we just kind of like looked in the fridge and we're like, well, this would work and this would work. So we yeah, I do like, that all the time. 
Yeah, I know, right? Sometimes you don't have all the ingredients. And sometimes you're like, oh, this is actually pretty good with those ingredients. So then you have two recipes, right? <laughs> yeah, it was yeah, so nice. good. So good. Cool. Thank you so much for making, making my recipe. So oh, I would like to ask you more about your ebook in the bundle party food i know i've been very very excited about it because i've been seeing all your stories and um mm -hmm. how many recipes are there here there's 50 there's 50, 50. recipes wow. in there. yeah 50 recipes and i know right they're so good look at those and there's a section in there on social eating because it's about parties right taquitos yeah oh my God. Those are, yeah, yeah falafel I want, balls. I want, to, I want to make this. I definitely want to make this. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. They're so cool. So what I did for this book was um, I like to go either to the library or just go online somewhere. And I look for inspiration, right? And as much as I don't like seeing animal products in pictures of food, I was trying to get inspired with ideas for this mm -hmm. book. So I would look through Pinterest and stuff and I'd find a recipe and I'd be like, this looks so good. And I, like, how can I make it raw? What can I do to turn this into a raw appetizer? So, I, and that's the, the beauty of being a chef, right? You get to experiment and try new things and see if this works, if that works. There were some recipes that didn't turn out at first, but then I try it again with a different thing and just like so fun to play around, but that's how I got inspired for it. Was I just was I searching for appetizers in general? Like I would pretend that I was going to a party. What would I? Mm. Bring? So I went looking for inspiration, and then I just made raw versions of everything. So, um, what are your top three favorite recipes from the ebook? Ooh. <laughs> Well, I'm not asking you for one, so top three. Right, I know. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so you can choose. I well, need choice. Five if you want as well. That's right? Fine. Yeah, I know. All of them. All of them. No, just kidding. <laughs> so if I had to make three recipes from there tomorrow, yeah. number one, I would say right now, because you, you, my, my taste changes every moment, but right now I would probably say the green onion cakes. Oh. Okay, yeah, you've been talking about a lot about that because that's from like Canada, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. It's so good. I, I used to eat them a lot when I was younger, so it does remind me of my childhood. And these these green onion cakes use Irish sea moss gel. Yes, there we go. And that sauce is just amazing. I love that sauce so much. And it wrote and when I first tasted them, like when I first made them they were a little soft so i had to change the dehydration time and i had to practice with them a little bit but the longer you dehydrate them the more um the more solid they become and i had let them dehydrate longer than i had originally thought that it would be and after i'd let them dehydrate longer time i ate one and i was like this is amazing i was so happy with the results and i didn't expect it I actually thought wow. when I originally down, uh, when I originally created that recipe, I thought I was going to have to take it out of the book because they weren't working the way I thought they would work. But when I let them sit in the dehydrator a little bit longer, it was like magic. All of a sudden they became green onion cakes. And I was like, yay, I figured it out just by letting them sit there a little longer. And those were probably my favorite. The second thing that I would make, I would have to say would be the pepper nori sticks. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Those I are think... some of my favorites, the pepper nori sticks. And what else? What else? Yeah, I think my boyfriend would love this. I think he'll like everything in the, <laughs> your ebook because it's. Yeah, I was showing him. I'm like, would you eat this? Would you eat this? It's like, yeah. <laughs> That's so awesome. Yeah, yeah I keep pepper... eating him green smoothies instead. So. Oh yeah, he's gonna love them. He's gonna love them. Yeah, the pepper nori sticks are really nice because they're a lot like pepperoni sticks. I try to keep the flavor of the filling to be as close to like a peppery 
pepperoni flavor as I could. And people could add like smoke, liquid smoke to it as well to give it a little bit more of like a smoky flavor. Um, but those ones are, are probably my favorite for just like a snack. You could just grab one or two and munch on them. Or you could take them hiking as well, take them traveling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could have a bunch in a bag and take them on an airplane or whatever so that you have something raw, something easy. They are dehydrated quite a bit, so you do need to drink a little bit more water when you're eating a lot of dehydrated foods. But they are really fun, and they're great to take to parties because people just eat. They're like, what? This is raw. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really cool. And then I would say right now, my third that I would make would probably be... Oh my gosh. <laughs> Maybe the taco cups. Oh, okay. The taco cups are really fun to make because they actually hold their shape really well. The little taco cups. Yeah, hold their I shape. saw you I, I saw you show that in your story as well. So I'm just like scrolling through your pictures to see if I can find I think it's one oh, of the first on the front, right? Yeah, I think it's the first one. There you go. Yeah, on the front right? page. Yeah. Yeah. Taco cups. I, I love the colors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Those oh. are so, those are some of the ones that I would probably make like off the top of my head. But when when I go through my book, I'm always like, oh yeah, that's a good one. Oh yeah, I forgot I even made that one. <laughs> I know that happens to me as well. I if I make it and then I only announce it like a, a month or two later, and then when I start looking at it, I go like, ooh, this one. Ooh, I should make this again. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> right. Totally. I know that happens. And like now I'm just thinking um, we had made the like coconut. It's like coconut shrimp, but it's oyster oh, mushroom. Yeah. yeah. yeah and I saw that. That was one of Nate's That's favorites. Amazing. Yeah. That was yeah. one of Nate's favorites. Um, and then there's two sushi recipes Is in there. This one? Yep. That one. I know. It's, yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's something my. Like, it's something like any of my friends will eat, whether they're raw or vegan or not. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And you don't have to be raw or vegan to eat these things, right? We all know that we should be eating more vegetables. We all know that we got to start eating healthier foods. So why not grab the bundle and start exploring the amazing creations that other people come up with? Because there's some really tasty stuff in this bundle, seriously. Oh, I wanted to ask you about liquid smoke since you mentioned it. Um, what are your thoughts on it? At, at one point, I was afraid of using it. And then someone gave me a bottle and I, I started using it. I was like, wow, yeah. <laughs> I was blown away by the taste. But I'm yeah. like, should I? Should I not? Should I? Yeah, um, we've only used it a couple times. And it really depends on what we're making, if we are going to use it or not. So it's only like a couple times a year. If we do use it, we'll add a little bit to... Um, specific specific recipes like if it needs to be have a smoked flavor if it needs to yeah. have a smoked flavor we always default to smoked paprika because it already yeah, that's has what I do as well yeah like yeah it already the, has that smoky yeah. flavor you could if if somebody was adding salt to their foods like we don't add salt we use miso paste or coconut aminos but if somebody was adding salt you can actually get smoked salt which mm, yes. has that yeah. smoky flavor if you didn't want to use um, the smoke, liquid smoke. But mm. I think honestly, like we live in a city, we breathe toxins in, and I'm not saying that it's yeah. okay to keep adding more toxins over top of more toxins. And I'm not right. saying that liquid smoke is toxic, but you know, mm. a lot, some liquid smokes have sugar, like refined sugar added to it or other ingredients. So really it's about choosing the best one with the least amount of um, preservatives or anything else right. in there. So it's, yeah. I don't think, again, I'm not like, um, like a purist. I don't eat 100% raw because there are some things in my diet that I keep in there that aren't considered raw. I just don't cook any of my mm. meals. So things mm. like coconut aminos, nutritional yeah. yeast, maple syrup, smoked paprika, and even nuts. Like a lot of nuts are not actually raw, like cashews. Yeah. They're heated to high temperatures 
So they're not considered an actual raw food, right? So, but those are just a few things in my diet that I keep. But then there's other things that some people don't consider to be raw foods, but I consider to be raw foods, things like sauerkraut and kimchi and miso paste, right? They sometimes, it depends on how you make it or what have you, but sometimes they're cooked first and then fermented and they then become a living food. So I consider them raw foods and we eat those foods too, but we make a lot of them ourselves. The only thing that we really buy is miso paste. Yeah, so, I've, yeah. I've always been thinking about making my own miso, but um, I just never got around to doing it because it was, it was a bit harder to get the koji balls, but now mm. you can, now I can. But I just, it's just so easy to get <laughs> by them. So I, right. But yeah, it's something I want to. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's how I felt with um, Irish moss. Like, I, I had Irish moss sitting in our cupboard for two years, and I never made it. It just sat there, and I was like, I'll make it one day, you know, like, I've got so much work to do, I'm not going to make it, blah, blah, blah. Not realizing how easy it actually was to make it. You just soak it and then blend it. Like, it wasn't hard. Um, but now that I am using it, and a lot of the recipes in my new book use Irish moss, it's going to become a part of our diet now. We add it to our smoothies and it has everything that we need to create healthy collagen in our bodies. So it's really good for anti-aging, your joints, your skin, all that good stuff. So we are adding it to our life. And the green onion cakes have a lot of Irish moss in it. So they're a really good way to get your Irish moss in and get that good food. You know what? I can totally relate to what you said about Irish moss because I also sitting <laughs> in my fridge, like just the, the raw version for yeah, pretty much two years as well. Two years. And then, <laughs> and, and, and I used it I think once and then after I just kept it there. And then when I got your book, Party Food, I was like, Oh, I think really I should make some. So I made the whole bottle. Nice. Yeah, and then I added it into my smoothies and then into my acai bowls. And then, mm -hmm. yeah, I need to use it when I make your recipes as well. That's why I was giggling. I was like, oh my God, that's the same as me. <laughs> Left it there. Like, yeah, I know. I feel like a lot of people fall into that too. Like, we're not alone for sure. Because uh, people feel like it's a lot more work, but it actually isn't. Once you, no, once you really. do it once, you're like, oh yeah, that wasn't so bad. Someone's asking yeah. what is is Irish moss. Irish it's, moss. it's a sea vegetable. So it's a moss that grows in the sea um, off the coast of Ireland. You can get other sea moss. I like the Irish one personally. And you basically, you buy it dry and you soak it for like 24 to 48 hours in water, clean water, and you rinse it a few times just to get rid of the, uh, sometimes some companies have sand still in their bags. So you really have to rinse it well so you don't have sand in your mouth or whatever when you're eating it. And so once you rinse it really well, you just put the Irish moss, the fully hydrated moss, into a blender and you blend it with a little bit of water and then you have gel. And it's, it looks like slime when you first pour it into the jar. It's, I, I remember my stories, I played the Ghostbusters theme song and I had the slime because it was like slime like <laughs> and then once it's in the fridge it turns into a gel kind of almost like gelatin you, like you could probably yeah. I want to play around with it because I'm thinking you could make like little jelly candies with it if you mixed it with a fruit concentrate like um a thick puree or some kind like raspberry puree and then mixed it with that you could probably make little jelly candies with it they would be really soft, but I'm going to play around with some ideas for that. But it's really easy, and it lasts, like, I don't know, three weeks in your fridge. But I highly recommend if people have a vacuum blender. I'm, like, hardcore pro vacuum blending now. All of a sudden, like, once we got it, we're like, we're never going back ever. <laughs> but if you vacuum blend it, you're not blending all the air into it, so it's even thicker and it's preserved a lot longer because you're not blending the air into, into mm. it where it will go bad faster. So definitely, yeah, sea moss, you can get online anywhere, just search Irish moss and you should be able to find it. So yeah, delicious. <laughs> and it doesn't have a flavor, so you can flavor it, right? It makes dishes more pliable. Like you can add it to wraps, 
so that it's more pliable. And I add it to the Christmas quiche, which is in the Christmas ebook. Mm, yeah, that's why I, that's why I used it. Yes. Yeah, I know quiche, your picture yeah. of the quiche is so amazing. I was like, we need to make that again. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I, so I ordered um, like red bell pepper, and I ordered broccoli and spinach, and all that didn't turn up on the day, and I was like, what? Because I don't know, like. Because I ordered online, and then I was like, oh, okay, I guess I'll just have to put in other ingredients instead. So I had to, I put in carrots, and I put in um, celery, and I put in some celery leaves instead, so that it will look a bit more spinachy and all that. Yeah, but yeah, I was telling you, I, 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 I'm glad you like the photo, because I was like, oh, I need to, I thought I needed to put more props and make it more pretty, but I'm just like, I don't want to eat this. I'm just going to take like one, two photos, and I'm going to devour everything. I'm not going to... Yeah, yeah but so I do that too. I do that too. Sometimes I'm just like, it's the same background, but I just need one picture and then I can eat. That's it. <laughs> oh yeah. So that I think this is a good segue into like talking about your food photography. Because mm -hmm. you did all the photos for um for this. And I know that in previous in your previous life also you used to do you used to work as a photographer as well. So tell us more. Yeah, so I began my photography career probably in like around 2005, maybe earlier than that. I was venturing into photography since about 2001, because in 2001, that's when I bought my first film camera. And I start, I was 21 and I was like wondering what I'm going to do with my life. And I was really into photography. So I bought this film camera and I was taking pictures of like family and friends and I was really enjoying it. So then later on, um, I started to really get into digital photography. And in 2008, I incorporated my own photography, my freelance photography company, Raimondi Art and Photography. And from there, I started doing um, families and weddings and babies and newborns and stuff like that. And then around 2010, I would say, that's when I created my boudoir studio. So it was in the oh. basement of a house that I used to live in. And we renovated the entire basement so that it was like a boudoir studio. And then I created oh. Candy and Cream Boudoir, where I was taking photos of women um, in whatever they wanted to wear, whether it was lingerie or a ball gown or whatever, as long as they felt amazing. I just wanted to take pictures of them feeling amazing. We would get their hair and makeup done and then they would be able to wear any props or high heels if they wanted to or barefoot if they wanted to. We just wanted them to feel beautiful in whatever way that was for them. And we did really well, myself and my friend Heather, who was my hair and makeup girl. And we did that for about four, five years. We did that for five years oh. and, um, then when I got divorced, I lost my studio because it was in my ex's house. And it was okay because I went back to doing more weddings, more family, more portraits and that kind of thing. And then I, and then about like 2018 is when I, I stopped doing people photography and I started doing food photography and I started really working on raw food romance and kind of honing my skills for food photography. And everybody has their different styles. Like, I really, really love the really dark lighting with a really light contrast. But I just, whenever I edit my photos, they just never turn out like that because I have my own style, right? And it's just what I default to. So we each have our own style. And it took me a really long time to find my style originally when I was doing the boudoir photography. But I feel like it's, it's, such a, it's such a creative way of showing off our art when we come at it from a food perspective. So we get to create these beautiful dishes and we get to photograph them and share them with the world to inspire others to eat more vegan, more raw, and that it doesn't have to be just a boring salad or just a plate of fruit, even though those are good, right? 
it, we like to decorate and make it look p pretty. And some people don't like doing that, but I, I totally love doing it. I, it's almost better to eat when it's all pretty and presented all nice and stuff. <laughs> but that's my journey with photography. And I have like all my pro stuff, all my pro gear that I had from my pro days. And I had to close my photography business when I moved to the US because it was a Canadian corporation. So that was all a oh. headache and a half. But yeah, now I just do raw food romance. And I, I just I still love photography, but more so the food photography aspect of it. So how long does like, um, how long do you spend um, taking like, photos for one dish? Mm -hmm. Ooh, good question. So when I, it depends, if I'm hungry, uh, I'll just take one picture, like we said, right? <laughs> just one, and that's good. But if I'm doing stuff for multiple days, because like you mentioned earlier in our live, I have so much content, I like to have various photos. And, you know, we only eat three times a day. And most of the time, it's just a smoothie. And I don't really want to take a bunch of pictures of just smoothies. I like the salads because they're colorful and there's all different kinds of things going on there. So what I like to do is I will, I call it content multiplying. So mm -hmm. I'll take the, the picture of the food before I chop it. And then I take a picture of the food while I'm chopping it or while I'm rolling sushi rolls or, you know, the mess in the kitchen or what have you. Then I take a picture of just the vegetables in the salad and then with the dressing on top and then I mix it and then I take a picture of that and then I maybe put it in a different bowl, change the props. And then I take the same salad, but in a different look. And then I can end up with like, you know, six or seven different photos of the same dish, but at different stages of the dish. That way I have a little bit more content to share so I can share it with my value, but still not have to make like extra dishes that I might not be eating because you can only eat so much in a day, right? I can't make five <laughs> dishes just to get pictures. So I do like to arrange them differently. And I would say if I'm, in the mood to take multiple photos like that, I can get anywhere between, I would say six and 12 photos. They're all very different from the same dish. So yeah, I would say six yeah. to 12. And do you use your phone or do you use a DSLR to take the photos? For Instagram, I would say 95% of the pictures that I post are from my phone believe it or not. <laughs> I have this like $5,000 camera that I bought, like, <laughs> I don't know, it would be like four years ago now. And it's my dream camera. I love it. But it's just easier to take with my phone and edit on my phone and then post to Instagram, right? <laughs> so yeah, what, but what, cam what camera is that? I'm just curious, because I oh. need to get, you know what, I'm using a borrowed DSLR, and I need to buy an actual one by there's so many choices out there. I'm like, I don't know which one to get, you know? Yeah, so, so yeah. I'm a Nikon girl. I love Nikon. Oh, That's my favorite person. I, but I mean, it really doesn't matter. But I have the D850, which... Oh, okay. Which, yeah, I used to have the yeah. D700, which is like one of their flagship best products that they've had in the last 10 years or more, 15 years, I'd say. And I bought my D700 in 2008. I was 28. Um... And at the time, it was about $3,500 US. And so I bought that. I invested in that. And that camera has been a, like an incredible investment for me because that specific camera had a lot more actuations life than a typical camera. So that camera was rated at 150,000 oh. clicks, actu actuations. Right. But yeah, yeah. Uh, no, no, yeah, 150,000. And mine was like over 400,000. And it's still, I still have it and it still takes pictures. So it, it's been an incredible camera, but it was around, um, actually, I think I saw my friend Nikita in our, in the chat. She had, she oh. joined or something, my friend Nikita. And it was at her photo shoot, ironically enough, that my camera wasn't working, like the shutter wasn't going off and there was something wrong with it. Because I've, I've happened to have quite a few problems with it in the last couple years of its life. Like I said, it still oh. works, but it's not reliable anymore. Like I, I needed to have a backup camera 
And sure. for some reason, the camera was not working at this photo shoot. I was doing her newborn. She had just had a baby oh. and I was doing her newborn photos. And the camera wasn't working. I was like, what do I do? <laughs> so I called up the camera store and I said, do you have any um, D850s that I could rent for the weekend? Because I had her photo shoot and then the next day I had another photo shoot. So I'm like, I'm just gonna rent it for the weekend and then I'll figure out what I'm gonna do after that. So when I went to the store, they said, yes, we have one camera left. And I had left the photo shoot. I was gonna come back with that camera and finish the photo shoot. When I got to the camera store, they were like, this is the only one we have available because it was brand new at the time and I really wanted to try one. And they're like, there was a customer who didn't want to buy it. So we have this extra one that you could rent for the weekend. And I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna buy it. So I bought Ooh. that camera, it was like $5,000. And that was a lot of money back then. I had to use credit because, but I needed this camera. <laughs> <laughs> so I bought that camera and that's been my absolute favorite camera that I've ever had. It's, right. it's amazing. And it does video, like it's a slow motion video and, and it does ah. some really amazing stuff. It's, it's one of my favorites. And I know there's always going to be new cameras coming out and new tech and, and different brands and stuff, but that's my personal favorite. I like that one the best. Right. So, so for your, your party food um, book that you use, was that the camera you used? Or no, it, that was my phone. <laughs> I used my yeah, phone. It's so much easier, right? It's so convenient as well. And then I know you do the edits on your phone itself in Lightroom. So it's mm -hmm. just way easier. Yeah, it's just way easier. Uh, the burger book, the burger book and the soup book, I used my professional camera for those. Ah, okay. okay. Yeah, this party food book was the first book that I used my phone for the photos. Mm. Okay. How long did it take you to come um, create the, the party food book from start to finish? From start to finish, I would say, yeah. I think I started it around, probably around late July, I would say. And, and what I did for that book was I typed up all the recipes the way I felt that it would be, like the, the way that it made most sense in my mind. So I typed up all 50 of the recipes. And then during one weekend, Nate and I made all 50 recipes for the photos. <laughs> I saw your stories and I was asking my boyfriend, like, how does she do that? How does she make like so many recipes in one weekend? Because I was doing my, my food, like I think just one dish a day or something, sometimes two, you know, but I wouldn't be able to do so many in one weekend. <laughs> right right it was it was really fun because what i would do is i would look through my book and i would say okay so this recipe needs eight hours of dehydrating so i need to start that one at 8 a.m for it to be ready at this time right and then i would work on this the second dish that needed to be ready here and i planned out the day so that i was working on things and putting them in the dehydrator and then working on other things and then blending a sauce for this recipe and and so I had like a plan of exactly what I needed to do to get all of the recipes done. And Nate helped mm -hmm. a lot because he, I would tell him, hey, can you make this recipe? And he would follow it in the book. Mm -hmm. And so right, it was kind of right, like right. he was testing out the recipe to see if someone else could make it, right? Mm -hmm. And so he made a lot of yeah. recipes and I made a lot of recipes. And then as soon as he was done one, I'd be like, okay, start on this next one. And then I took his stuff and I would plate it and then go take a picture. So it was really fun. It was, they're long days. They're like, I don't know, like at least 12 hour days, 12 mm -hmm. to 14 hours. We would get up early in the morning and we would just start working. And sometimes if it got too late, like if it was too dark, I would save the food. I would just put it in the dehydrator or in the fridge. And then the next morning it was like, photo, 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 photo of the stuff that we had made the night before. So we were able to get all of the um, recipes done in the weekend. And the reason why we did it that way is because I find like I could do it one or two recipes a day, but I feel like it, it's so much easier to batch create and have all the photos all in one place. Cause I would take the photos over two days in my phone. Mm -hmm. So they're easy to find, right? Like if I made a recipe two months ago, I'd have to go back. Oh my yeah, phone. yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I'm not very good at organizing my photos. So, <laughs> so I really liked having them all done. Plus the photos also all have a really similar theme, mm, right? Yes. So there's a, yeah, there's a continuity there. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Because yeah. there are some um, recipe books that I wanted to do in the past. And I was like, okay, well, I'll take this recipe now. And then like, by the time I'm ready to create the book, I don't like the photo that I took way back then because I've changed my taste and I want to do it this way or I got new backdrops and I want to use new dishes. So I, I want to redo it anyway. So it's like, might as well just do them all at one time. Mm-hmm. You're using natural lighting for your photos, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But has it ever happened? Because like yesterday I was making this dessert pizza thing. And then suddenly it started raining. And there was a storm and there's no more light. And I'm like, oh. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's why, that's why I like um, Lightroom a lot. Because you can increase the exposure if you need to. Um, I, I really don't like taking um, photos at night of like evening salads. Also, another reason why Nate and I like to eat earlier in the day, because there's still daylight, we can still take decent photos of our dinner instead of eating at like 9 30 or 10 where it's not the best to go to bed digesting Mm. your food for one for health purposes but also it's too dark for photos so it's kind of incentive (laughs) to eat earlier in the day um but i yeah natural light for sure when we were living in oregon we lived in oregon for two years prior to moving here in vegas that house had very little sun exposure like we we hardly had any oh, yeah, different had one sun. spot right yeah <laughs> yeah just the one spot and it would just go across the floor and the cats would kind of follow it <laughs> but we had a balcony uh, like a sliding door kind of balcony area but there was a really big awning so it it hid a lot of the light like we'd have light come in but it wasn't bright light it was subdued light because we were under a lot of shade And I found it so difficult to have really nice pictures unless it was a really bright sunny day. And I was taking photos between like, I don't know, 11 a.m. and and 1 p.m. That was like the best time Mm. to take photos. Mm. So I was really limited in my lighting. Whereas here in Vegas, I can take photos from like 6 a.m. to 5 p.m. And the entire time the photos are gorgeous because we've got these windows back here and and mm. because we're right on the edge of the building there's no mm. awning there's no balcony above us so we get all the direct sunlight and it's not like like bright sunny but we get so much brightness that the photos just look so much better i'm like i never want to move from here because the lighting is just amazing <laughs> but natural yeah, I, light for sure yeah yeah I, I've been to Vegas once, uh, way back in 2004. Oh. Um, that time I would, yeah, I was, um, that time I was still in my corporate job and then um, we were having a conference. Yeah, I was in IT, so we had, they, they always have IT conferences in Vegas somehow. So yeah, I remember how bright it was. Mm-hmm. I remember how confusing it was because it'll be hot outside. And then the moment we walk into a building and it'll be so cold. <laughs> That is so true. I know it's the a- the air conditioner. They have like so much. Yes, uh, they just have it on a full blast, right? Yeah, <laughs> full blast, full full blast. And yeah, we had somebody in the chat say that very Vegas is very dry. Um, we personally love the desert, and and myself specifically, I'm like I love the desert. And we lived in Oregon for. A, two years like I said and Nate grew up in Oregon and Oregon's beautiful Mm. and there's lots of lushness and stuff but there's also beauty in the desert and I love the heat the hotter the better for me I love it and the desert is incredibly beautiful there's there it's probably one of my favorite places my favorite place right now that I've ever visited was Bryce Canyon in Utah definitely like no area that I've personally been to um, tops it. And I know there's more beautiful places in the world that are all, they're all beautiful in their own way. But for me, from where I've visited, Bryce Canyon is by far my favorite. So I love the desert. I just love 
the colors of the rocks. I love that you can see everything, all the rocks and all their beauty. But yeah, Vegas is a really interesting place to live. That's for sure. I, and I do love it here. <laughs> what, what's the um, temperature in the day? In the day, right like? now, I would say, I don't know, it's like 28 degrees Celsius or probably like, oh, I don't know, okay. yeah, 75. That's pretty much like here right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's nice. Yeah. Like, it's not like super hot. But in the, in yeah. the summertime, it gets up to like 44 Ooh. for like months, right? It, it just started cooling off in, in the end of September, where it was like still 30, 33, 36. Um, but now it's like 28 to 30. That's typical temperature now and it'll probably go down. But yeah. it gets pretty cold at night in like right now it's chilly and I'm like wearing this because we were out earlier and, and it's it is a little bit chillier now. But compared to where I used to live, I mean, <laughs> I was in Canada and it went to like minus 45 in the winter. So it was like super, super, super cold. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I've been to Canada once. Like, I, I, I was in Edmonton, but this was like, I don't know, when I was 22 or something. So like many, many, many years ago. Um, I don't remember much. I remember having really good food. <laughs> <laughs> we went to, um, yeah, we went to Ben. Ben, mm -hmm. ben? Mm, Yeah. And um, yeah, I, I remember we just ate a lot. Yeah, Banff was approximately a seven, seven and a half hour drive from where I lived, where I grew up. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, right. it's beautiful there. Like, so beautiful. And um, Jasper is another one. Uh, that was oh, only three and a half hours away from where I lived. Right. So I'm, 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 I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna have to end soon. Uh, yeah. Coming to the hour. Uh, but I'm just wondering, does anybody have any questions? I don't, I think we answered most of the questions, right? I don't think one with any. Yeah, I was, I was checking. I think we got them all. Oh, Sunny's in Alberta. Hello. <laughs> Alberta, that's where I'm from. That's where I'm okay. from. <laughs> cool. In that case, um, Lisa, do you have anything that you, you want to say? Uh, any last words? Yeah. Um, I always like to end with reminding everybody that you are important and you are valued and you are loved mm -hmm. and you deserve to take care of yourself because I feel like far too many people do so much for everyone else that they neglect themselves. And we can be more of service to others when we are of service to ourselves. So it's really important to... Take care of yourself, eat properly, be hydrated, sleep well, exercise. You know, all the things that we strive to do, not all of us do them all, but it's best to keep going and do your best and know that you're loved and to get the bundle because the bundle's amazing, right? You can get it from um, Yin's link in her bio. You can get it from mine, um, but the bundle is amazing and her book's in it, my book's in it, and 53 other books are in it too. So for 50 bucks. Yeah, it's such great value. I mean, I got the first bundle and it was like, it was so good. I made so many recipes from there and then now I'm part of this bundle. I'm so grateful to be mm. part of it. It's, it's been such an amazing experience and I want to say because, you know, in Malaysia, there are not many raw vegans around. So sometimes I feel quite isolated. So mm -hmm. I, I'm like, oh, it's so nice to be around people who understand what I do and what I talk about. And, right. And, I know. Yeah. And that's what we wanted to do with this bundle. We wanted to make it an online festival. So every day we have like 30 lives that are going on. Yeah, there's so many lives. 20 to 30 lives. And if anybody wants to see the live schedule for tomorrow and for all the next days until November 1st, again, click the link in either of our bios and go check out the live schedule and see when Yin's going to be on next, when I'm going to be on next. And maybe there's a talk that really resonates with you and you want to join in and learn from them. So check the link in our bios. Um, Yin has it pinned in the bottom of the chat. So go check that out see what's going on, see all the good stuff, and buy the bundle. Because if you want to support us, get the bundle. That's the best way. Go to Yin's link and, and grab the bundle. Amazing stuff. Okay, cool. Thank you so much, Lisa, for this. And 
thank you everyone for joining us and um maybe we'll see you guys in another live and um <laughs> yeah get the bundle it ends on november 1st so it's great value it's not just ebooks there's also courses there's also videos there's audio books you know there's things on and it's not just recipes as well there's also things on mm -hmm. vegan business conscious mindset there's a yoga retreat um, there's Nate's book on growing microgreens so like really 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 cool stuff mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So, thank uh, you for being uh, part of the bundle we love thank you, you. <laughs> yeah. yeah okay then I'm gonna go off and I, I think I might make um, try out one of the pesto recipes um, yeah in a bundle and I'll, I'll see you guys another time thanks Lisa. awesome alright uh, big hugs big hugs <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>